Welcome to the Mapscaping Podcast. My name is Daniel and this is a podcast for the geospatial community. Today on the podcast we're talking about modern geospatial. So note the word modern. Not the bleeding edge of geospatial but modern geospatial. What is it? Well, my guest, Will Cadell, CEO of Spark Geo, describes modern geospatial as the intersection of the cloud, smart space, open source data and standards, AI and smart devices. That's modern geospatial. And as you were here during the discussion, it's important to understand the difference between modernization and innovation when we think about moving people from where they are now to where they want to be with regards to their geospatial capabilities. And you might be listening to this wondering, well, what does any of this have to do with me? I just want to make better things. I just want to help people use all this awesome geospatial stuff. But you don't get to do that without first understanding what does better look like for them. What is their version of awesome geospatial stuff? And that is why you should listen to this podcast episode. If you enjoy this episode and are interested in the topic of modern geospatial, check out the conference called North 51. I had the pleasure of attending this last year. It was fantastic. And this year's conference theme is modern geospatial. So it'd be well worth checking out if you're interested in that. Before we get started today, I also want to thank my sponsor, Scribble Maps. Augment your GIS workflows and bring GIS to all levels of the organization with Scribble Maps. So, so this is the marketing tag, tagline that I need to read out for you, but I want to highlight a few things about this. Augment, not replace. So Scribble Maps, when I talk to them, they completely understand this is not a replacement for just desktop GIS. This is an augmentation of it. And I could see this being really powerful, you know, put together with a, uh, a desktop GIS platform like QGIS, for example. And in, in the next bit in the in the tagline there, bring GIS to all levels of your organization. This is really hard. <laughs> this is a really hard problem to solve. I'm currently working as a consultant for an organization, and this is one of the challenges that I'm facing. So people need access to the data, and I simply don't have the tools to, to give it to them. I mean, I, I have some tools at my disposal, but they don't strike that right balance of functionality and ease of use that Scribble Maps offers. And um, unfortunately, I can't just click my fingers and move to Scribble Maps. But I think if you are in a similar situation, check out Scribble Maps. I, yeah, it, it might be the tool that you've been looking for. So Scribble Maps offers collaborative editing, you know, that you can do business intelligence, annotation, and they actually have a ton of functionality in there. I, I'm not going to list them off now, but it, it, it would be worth checking out if you are interested book a demo with them. If you mention Mapscaping, you'll get a discount. So I have had uh, the CEO of Scribble Maps on the podcast before. The episode is called The Business of Web Maps, and it's well worth listening to. It'll change the way you think about web mapping it as a business. Jonathan, the CEO, is open, honest. It's, it's a great conversation. So thank you, Scribble Maps, for supporting the podcast. You don't just make this episode possible, you make all of the episodes possible. And I, I really appreciate it. Okay, let's move on and talk about modern geospatial with Will Cadell, CEO of SparkGeo. Hey Will, welcome to the podcast. Today we're going to talk about modern geospatial. So this is something you've written a ton about in your Substack newsletter, which I highly recommend to all the listeners. But I think before we dive into that, let, let's have a bit of background. So you are the founder, owner of SparkGeo. Can you add something more to that brief, brief introduction? Sure. Sparkgeo has been around for, well, since 2010, so I guess almost 14 years. Since uh, before that, I was in government science. I, I did a little bit of municipal work. And then I did some forestry work in Canada, came over to Canada from the UK. You might be able to detect I have, I have a, a, a silly accent. I've been, I've been <laughs> bathing in Tim Hortons for 20 years, and it, this is what it does to a Scottish accent. It, it kind of flattens it out a bit. So uh, I've been in Canada for 20 years. I've run Spartio for 14 of those. Spent a bit of time in the forestry sector, the resource sector before that. And yeah, since starting Spartio, we've been putting maps on the internet, if you like, uh, cloud-centric geospatial software development. I used to write a lot of code. I now think I am possibly the worst software developer in the company. Uh, so I end up talking about code now. That's the background. We spent a lot of time interfacing with what I would call innovative stroke futuristic geospatial organizations and institutions and startups. I count myself very lucky being able to think about uh, the cutting edge of, of geospatial and how it is maybe a little bit different now from what it possibly once was and possibly still is in different organizations. So. I think we're at a very exciting time. This is why I talk about this notion of modern geospatial. 
And I think we have a lot of opportunities as a community, but we need to do a few things in our own uh, workflows and in our own thinking to realize those. So I very much appreciate the opportunity to, to have a chat about, about this idea, Daniel. Thank you very much. Oh, no worries. I'm absolutely stoked to have you as a guest on the podcast. Yeah. So before we get into that idea of you know, what we need to do to, to take advantage of these opportunities, let's start with a description of, of modern geospatial, a definition, if you will. What does it mean to you? A definition? I, I, I don't, unfortunately, have a very succinct sentence. I haven't thought through my value proposition. I'm sorry. <laughs> However, it's, it's a series of observations that I think are important. So firstly, the first observation I have, which is really, really obvious and really, really simple, is that geospatial people excel at building geospatial things for other geospatial people. And the, you know, the secondary observation is that there's a lot more other people than there are geospatial people. So those two things combined tells you a little bit about the modern audience, about uh, the modern audience of digital geography, shall we say. I would argue that GIS people at large didn't invent the tools that we as a population interface with on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think the most popular geospatial tools on the internet are either weather, they are navigation, or they are dialing up transportation. And I think those three uh, tools, so you can call them meteorology, we can call them navigation, we could call it logistics to some extent, personal logistics. Those three things dominate consumer geospatial, but I don't think any of them were invented by the GIS sector at large. So I'm really interested in how we can use modern tools, smart devices, you know, et cetera, et cetera, to enable more people, to get more people using uh, digital geography. I see that. And then I see this notion of complementary assets. So those are assets which might support a secondary ecosystem. So uh, think about the cloud. Think about smart devices I was just talking about. Think about AI. Think about open source. Think about smart space, commercial space. All those things are independent of geospatial technology. They, they operate in and of themselves. They are philosophies, they are workflows, they are technologies that have grown independently and act as a kind of complementary springboard for us in the geospatial community to do more. So we can leverage the cloud, we can leverage commercial space, we can leverage smart devices, we can leverage all sorts of these things. But the notion is, that the key thing is, that even five years ago, some of those independent assets didn't really overlap with each other, and now they all do. So where all those things overlap together, we have this notion, I think, of modern geospatial. So I would argue that today, we have a series of net new capabilities, which lead to net new opportunities. And I don't really think that the geospatial community at large sees the difference in what we can do today with what we were doing five or even 10 years ago. But I think there's a net new opportunity to do creative and new things within our kind of community of practice, if you like. So this combination of new potential or new people, this combination of new capabilities, and you could argue that there is some notion of new demand in the finance space. And I would argue that almost all the management and measurement techniques involved in anything to do with climate change will involve some kind of geospatial, some kind of geographic or remotely sensed data. So there's going to be a demand for geospatial technology. What that demand looks like, I have no idea. I don't know what the product for climate looks like. So this is kind of what I would call an inchoate demand. It's, it's like, it's this notional demand that we think is going to be something, but we don't know what the intrinsic products are going to look like. So if you think about those things, we've got new people, we've got new capabilities, and we've got new demands. I think that creates this new environment in which to, to do business. And that's what I'm 
loosely and you know somewhat lazily calling modern geospatial. So that's it's kind of how I'm packaging it. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. You, I, I got to say, you covered a lot of ground there. But if uh, just let me recap for a second. So, if we think about the intersection of the cloud, smart space, open source data and standards, AI algorithms, and smart devices, if we think about the Venn diagram of that and where they intersect, you're putting a circle there and saying, "Well, this is modern geospatial in there. It's the intersection of all of these things." I wonder, could we also say this is mature geospatial? Are these mature products or is, are, are we on the bleeding edge when we think about modern geospatial? That's a great segue into a discussion about technology maturity in general, because each one of those complementary assets that I talked about, each one of them has its own, what I would call like an inner quotes, an innovation curve. Now, that's not my word. That's, that's the word that the uh, sort of innovation community would use. An innovation curve describes this kind of S curve. It's an S whereby a particular technology starts off being very experimental and then it goes up into this and, and it's slow to evolve and it's hard and you have this piece at the bottom of the S-curve which, where adoption is pretty slow. And then you have this kind of linear piece in the middle where adoption is linear and that's where you have this kind of notion of incremental innovation, things are getting faster, things are getting better. And then at the top of the S curve, it kind of flattens out again, where the innovation is being, it, it has reached the peak. So if we think about, there's a great example in the literature about ice hunting, which is where people in Northeastern USA in the 1800s, there would be this big ice hunting industry where people would carve ice and then they would ship it to various different places to have, so people in India could have their gin and tonics and they could cool things in hot countries. So in effect, moving cold stuff from a cold country to a hot country to keep things cold in the hot country, if you imagine that, by boat. And there would be incremental innovation. They would figure out how to move the ice faster, how to chip it out quicker. And you, know, you can imagine that piece would be the middle piece of the S-curve. And then suddenly the adoption uh, flattens out because you know what, our thermal capabilities in those boats reached a, a maximum. We could only move those boats so fast. We could only chip out the ice so quickly. So the, the actual adoption flattened out. And then something amazing happened. People invented refrigeration, home refrigeration, which entirely disrupted that industry and it just went away. So think about that. You've got one S curve, which is we can chip ice and then we can ship it to a place. And then suddenly it's disrupted by an entirely different S curve, which is we can build refrigerators and sell them to people in those hot countries, and then we don't have to move any ice whatsoever. So if you think about those two things, it describes two processes uh, which sit on two innovation curves. Now, when we think about geospatial, we can argue a few things about innovation curves. You could say desktop GIS is one innovation curve. You could argue web maps is a secondary one. You could also argue that augmented reality might be a third one, and each of these kind of hops to the other one. However, you would argue, you could also take apart those innovation curves and say, well, desktop GIS is kind of evolving into web GIS in terms of these kind of hybrid systems. So ArcPro will be one. Uh, QGIS is, has, has been hybrid for a while too. So if you think about that, and those, this notion of the web is dependent upon the complementary asset that is the internet, and one would argue these days the cloud. So what we're trying to do here by talking about modern geospatial is challenging our community to think about what are those assets that are available in our purview. It could be the immediate purview, it could be a future purview. It could also be looking a little bit back in time. I'll get to that in a second. But what are those assets that are available that allow us to do net new things and allow us to advance and answer better questions and inject more uh, value into uh, the broader community. The interesting thing about those S-curves too is that different organizations feel comfortable in different places on that S-curve. So if you have like an enterprise organization, they may be less comfortable being right on the cutting edge. They want to make sure that things are just right now. And that, like, it's, it's a fairly safe bet. Yeah, it's a bit of technical risk, but not very much technical risk. It's more kind of business process oriented. Whereas startups, 
and more innovative companies are much more willing to take bets on what you'd call technical risk. Yeah, they can figure out the business process piece, but they're very agile, so business processes aren't so much of a burden. Whereas in a big enterprise organization, the business process, the human piece, can be quite a burden. So figuring out where different organizations sit within the context of an S-curve is really interesting because that allows you to determine where that organization is most willing to invest its time and, and what makes most sense from a, from a sort of technology advancement perspective. Does, does that help answer the question? Yeah, yeah, it does. I, I just want to highlight that idea that innovation S-curves are not necessarily the same as an organizational S-curve. At, at least that, that's one of the many things that, that I got out of you. And I think that that's really, really interesting because just because our innovation curve looks like this, it doesn't mean that our organization, those people that we're trying to you know, move forward, that we're trying to help, that we're seeking to serve, that they are necessarily moving at the same rate as, as innovation. I think adoption and innovation are quite different here. That's the bit I'd like to sort of move on to now is now knowing that, how do we identify where people are, where an organization is on the S-curve, and then how do we move them along the S-curve? Yeah, yeah. Let me, um, let me illustrate this with an example. So uh, Spark Geo, my organization, I, uh, like, largely I made the assessment that we need to do some, some of this spatial finance work. The spatial finance is going to be really important, and a lot of it's going to happen in the UK because it's going to be insurance-based first, and then it's going to move up the value chain into different financial organizations. So we made this assessment, and we made this rudimentary assumption and I'll, uh, I'll come back to that. Rudimentary assumption that we would be doing cloud native, you know, this and that. We'd be distributing data. We've got to do some analytics. We've got to measure. Like the, the core observation and insight is that landscape change is going to be important in the measurement of climate related activities for the, this notional spatial finance business, i.e., if you measure landscape changes, you can figure out if there are more or less trees. You can figure out if there's an increased amount of carbon in a particular place. You can figure out if there's an increased flood risk in a particular place based on landscape changes, if you like. And you can use remote sensing to determine landscape changes amongst other technologies, which allows you to you know, create analytics. So that was our assertion, our assumption. We go to the UK, start a business, and we start talking to people. And, and, you know, this makes us sound like we're utter fools. And, and we're not. We did put a lot of research in, in, into this. But the first thing we discover is that most of the financial sector isn't actually on the cloud, which when you're thinking about cloud native activities is a bit of a barrier. We kind of fell at the first hurdle. And, I was, I, you know, I, I make this joke. I, I tell my kids not to assume anything because it makes an ass out of you and me. And we definitely made an assumption. And we've just basically got to this notion. And, it, and it's an interesting observation, Daniel, because it, it talks exactly to the point you're talking to, which is where are organizations innovating? Where do they feel comfortable? So we discovered that a lot of the organizations that we were working with weren't necessarily on the cloud. So in terms of that S curve, we had some work to do. We got some modernization work to do. We've got to encourage organizations to feel that the cloud is a, is a safe and useful place to do business before we get to do all this kind of cloud native stuff. Or maybe we provide a managed service and give the, these organizations an easy entry point. So this, it, it, it's, not as, it's, not as if it was, um, it's not as if it was a brick wall by any means. It was just like, oh, this is interesting. We didn't think this would be the situation. But it is, so we'll manage for it. And that's, you know, that's how small agile businesses can operate. But it was just, it's an interesting note because you get to this point where, yeah, you know, we're a small, agile, innovative company and that's cool. But sometimes we're helping larger organizations with this notion of modernization, which might be a little bit different from innovation. It might be innovative for the large organization, but it, if you were to reflect back from the heady heights of a, of a, you know, a Silicon Valley startup, they might not view that activity as quite so innovative. They would view it as, you know, the default way of doing, of doing technology business. 
which is just a really interesting, like for me, it was a really interesting object lesson in expectation and in this notion of S-curves and figuring out that the, the S-curve doesn't just describe time, it describes a willingness to innovate and it describes almost exactly the size of different organizations and where they are in the application of more advanced technologies. So it, it, it was a really interesting object lesson in, in S-curves in practice, if you like. So yeah, that, like, honestly, that, that, is, that is really interesting. So if I'm understanding you correctly, the assumption here was, oh, these people are ready to innovate when in fact they needed to modernize first. And, and you showed up with an innovation plan or an innovation strategy when what was needed was modernization. Yeah. Maybe the modernization could have been just lift and shift to the cloud, do the exact same things just in a scalable environment. Maybe that was a form of modernization. But we come back to this idea of S-curves and identifying where people are on them. And so let, let's assume now that we understand where an organization is along the S-curve. And in this example that you've just given us, they were ready to modernize. What are the prerequisites for modernization? I think it's a willingness to move forward and a comfort around the particular uh, technology. So in the case of the cloud, it's been around for I don't know, what, 15 years? At least as long as Spark Geo. We've, we've literally never owned a server. So cloud technology has been around for at least that long. It, you know, I'm sure someone will correct us and tell us exactly how long it has, but I think we can say for sure over 15 years. And now we're getting to a place where some large organizations, not just in, in the finance sector, but also uh, across here in Canada, have, have said, you know what, we feel more comfortable with this. We can start moving this direction. And for me, that's, that's great. It's like music to my ears. But also, it's a really interesting note on when it makes sense for a certain company to do a certain thing. And it might not necessarily even be cost-driven. It might be driven by uh, needs within the organization. It might be driven by experiential needs. It might be driven by all sorts of different things. Or it might just be the fact that their employees are giving them such a hard time about not doing something that they've had to do something. Or, or it might be that the incumbent uh, uh, technology provider has provided this opportunity, which has subsequently started to make sense for the organization. So there's many different reasons why certain companies adopt certain technologies, but it's not, it, it doesn't always make uh, a ton of sense. It, 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 sometimes there's externalities that, that drive that. But number one, I would say is, is willingness. And within that willingness, there's, there's definitely a piece of what I would say, the management of career risk of uh, individuals in the middle management who actually might be the ones actually making the decisions, actually doing the work and actually taking the risk. And honestly, as an executive, as what I am, it's easy for me to wave my hands and say, innovation is great and collaboration is wonderful. But in the end, when the rubber hits the road in that middle management, that's where people are taking a risk on a new thing. So you have, you know, as a, as a technology provider, I have to be very kind of empathic towards those individuals who are taking a risk within their organization. They were doing a process, a value creation process in a certain way, and now they want to do it in a different way, which tells me that that there's a piece of risk in there and they're willing to manage it and they're willing to let us help them with that process. I mean, it's, there's, a, there's a lot of trust in that relationship. So we have to be quite careful with that too. So you talked a lot about risk just then and th this sort of gets back to my, one of my questions right at the start was, could we change modern geospatial to mature geospatial? All of these elements that, that we named right at the start, the cloud, uh, smart space, open source data, standards, AI, algorithms, smart devices, these are relatively mature, at least in my mind. Not to say they're stagnated, but they've been around for a while. They're well understood. And I think this is one of the ways of, of managing risk for organizations. Not showing up with something brand new, some, showing up with something that is mature, something that is, is modern. And I, I think too that larger organizations, and, and please correct me on this, I, I think they are probably more risk adverse than they are price sensitive. I totally agree with that statement. I just think the word mature makes it sound like it's old. 
but you know, whatever. Like different people see different words in different ways. I, I, I think we're getting at the same the same idea. It, it comes down to nomenclature and uh, the, the sort of the understanding of different things. Like the the key idea here is finding a way to raise expectations of broader organizations by illustrating the possible through you know exemplar applications. So that's that's what I say to my team is like we we need to provide uh, excellence so the broader community understands what is possible when we think about modern geospatial, when we think about applying the cloud, when we think about all those sensors floating around in low Earth orbit, all these things that are now possible that weren't before. When we think about 8 billion GPS-enabled smart devices like on the population of our planet, like, that wasn't possible a decade ago. And now a lot of those devices even have LiDAR built in. Like, what does that even mean for mapping? Like, all these questions are really interesting and actually kind of hard to parse. But thinking about this notion of exemplar applications and just raising expectations and encouraging the geospatial community not to do the minimum, but to do the possible. That's where I have been trying to encourage my team to go. But that's also within the context of this is the exemplar, but, but we can move you towards that because we all know that life, life is a spectrum. You're not just there. You don't just get there by, by paying enough money. You have to move your organization incrementally towards this notional sort of exemplar situation, which means that it's a vision, not a goal, because unfortunately, that exemplar is always going to get further away. You know, it's always going to get, there's always going to be something new happening. And that's good. I mean, that's, uh, that will allow us one day to, you know, to fly to Mars and all the rest of it. But as we move up or move forward, you know, side note, it kind of bugs me when people say move forward, because I'm never sure what direction forward is. But nevertheless, I'll take a step back. As we advance, again, forward direction, I don't know, as we make our technology better, our expectation of technology should also change. So we need to make sure that as enterprises, they don't get left behind, that they're pushed forward, that there, there is a need, a desire, an expectation that technology can move at an appropriate pace. I think injecting that higher level of expectation into the technology stacks of large organizations is, is important. And some are natively they have native expectations, i.e. they have high expectations built into their, their genetics, but some really don't. And, and those are the ones that we really need to empower, I think, with, with some good thinking. And just a second, I want to ask a question about like making promises that we can keep, because I think when you show up with the, these grand ideas, you also need to make a promise that you can keep. And I think broken promises are part of the reasons why uh, organizations are less willing to you know, take on this risk and to change. But we'll, we'll leave that just for a second. Do you see the gap between what we could consider modern and innovative? Do you see that shortening w with time? So you've owned or operated uh, Spark Geo for, what do you say, 10 years now? Do you, have you seen like a, a change in that gap or has it remained relatively constant? That gap, that gap definitely fluctuates. I would hazard that. So yeah, Spark Geo has been for 14 years, my gosh. I would hazard that by saying that most of the work we did in the first few years of Spark Geo was very much in the tech sector. Um, so we didn't do a, a large amount of what I would call enterprise-oriented geospatial activity at that point, except a couple of notable exceptions around like Google Maps implementations, like ATM finders and stuff and such like that. So it was like overtly kind of user-centric, slightly innovative for the time kind of activity, but we weren't like rebuilding uh, major geospatial systems inside enterprise. So I, I can't really comment on what it was like when we first started out, but I would say that I think these complementary assets have accelerated in their own domains significantly within the last five years. If we, we look at cloud technology, it's got so much wildly more capable. It, it, it seems very few organizations think about doing on-prem work, except 
within the context of uh, higher security needs. There are some notable exceptions. 37 Signals, for instance, are you know, they're very vocal about building systems which are not, not cloud-based these days, which is fine. I mean, it, it's good to have that argument being well articulated by that team. But I would say that cloud technology for geospatial as a, like a big, large data play, which is what geospatial really is, is a massive enabler. And it has enabled, in particular, the commercial space sector, the EO sector. So smart space enabling EO, the cloud enabling EO through storage, AI and algorithms enabling EO through uh, the pipeline delivery of algorithms through the cloud to create analytics. That's a workflow. I mean, and then publishing those analytics in a, with an open standard. So it's easily consumable by other organizations to collide different data with it. All that stuff is within this kind of Venn diagram. And all those things are growing and evolving independently of each other. Each of those things independently making this concept of modern geospatial more functional every day. So thinking about how all those things join together, your note on making promises is absolutely spot on. I think Earth observation in the early 2000s made a lot of promises which were not kept. And I'm not even sure those promises were made by the Earth observation sector. I think they were kind of sort of made by Hollywood and the Earth observation people were left kind of holding a very hard expectation of like video from space of anywhere at any time, which is like so far from the reality, it's, it's almost comedic. But I think it's still, I think it's still a really important concept because I think a lot of those promises can be kept. They're just really hard to manage for. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it, 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 it really does make sense. But I think, and the reason I want to mention it is because I think it's really important. If you're going to show up to an organization and say, hey, we're, we're with you on this journey. And my, my guess is an organization being risk adverse, that they want you to be there also next year and the year after that. And you, they, want, they don't want to work with, with multiple different partners, a new partner every month. That, that's not what they're into. They want to sign a contract and say, great, you're going to be here for the next five years. And in that time, we're going to move from here to there. And I think that if you can make that promise and actually fulfill it and keep the promise, I, I think I think you're 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 really going to make some big changes happen. Not just you know in, in geospatial, of course, in terms of modern geospatial, but also the flow-on effects of that are going to be humongous. But I think we need to make those longer-term promises and, and and keep them. Yeah, and, and and I think that's I think that's credible these days. I think that's very possible. I see a number of organizations on the market who are helping lar larger enterprise organizations kind of manage for innovation and manage for advancement. And what we've been most challenged with in Spark Geo recently hasn't been the deployment of geospatial code or, or anything like that. It's learning how to help organizations change, which is like super kind of businessy. And you're like, you see all this stuff on the internet about change management and transformation, this and, and, and all the rest of it. But in reality, Having a level of empathy around helping organizations and ultimately people, because it's people that are making decisions and it's people that are having to do a new thing. And it's, and it's middle management who ultimately have to lead. Helping those individuals win is literally the purpose of, of our organization's existence now, which is, which is so interesting. So yeah, we write code and yeah, we, we do very interesting like cloud deployments, and we, we talk to interesting geospatial companies all the time. But ultimately, our job is to help organizations win uh, through geospatial. And like winning sounds so binary. Like winning has got many, um, many different connotations. And I'm not winning, and I, I'm by no means a zero-sum game guy. I just want an organization to succeed through the use of geospatial technology. And in, in many ways, this notion of winning is confusing because because I think you could also win in collaboration. You don't have to win on your own. I think, I, I, I said it in a, like a video we made years ago, uh, but I think those organizations that are willing to team up and are willing to collaborate will necessarily outcompete anyone who's not, because it's very hard to do any of this kind of stuff on your own. Uh, it's much, much easier when you have a team 
when you collaborate, when you collaborate with, with different agile organizations, almost everything gets easier when you have teams. Not necessarily big teams, but just teams of different people and teams of different organizations uh, partnering um, because you get this diversity of thought. So there's a whole bunch of different interesting elements in there to unpack. Yeah, there, there sure is. I, I want to stay with this idea of winning just for a second because I think it's important to sort of emphasize that you know, a win for an organization is one thing, but throughout the different levels in that organization and right down to individuals, they all need to win too in some way, shape or form. I think this is not just important for people starting businesses in the, the geospatial world, but I think it's really important for practitioners as well. You get to do interesting work if you make it a win for somebody else. And I, I think <laughs> for me anyway, this is a really hard lesson to learn. I've tried to drag organizations that, and at the end of the day people kicking and screaming into the past and you know like from the deep deep past into the more the more recent past and it's been tough because it hasn't been an immediate win for them and it was a, a complete you know, mistake on, on my behalf a total fail but my learning from that was like well what would be a win for this person what would be a win at that level of this organization what would be a win for the organization as a whole those are completely different things but they need to be packaged together into whatever it is that you're promoting, selling, yeah, trying to do. Yeah, it's, it, it's so interesting. I remember like my second job, I worked in Perth and Kinross Council, uh, this is in Scotland, as their corporate address gazettier engineer. And so there was this big movement in the UK around normalizing addresses, which sounds like the, the most stupid thing. But in reality, in a city council like Perth and Kinross Council, there would be about four or five different address databases. So there'd be a health one, there'd be a tax one, there'd be an education one, blah, blah, blah. And the idea was, let's squidge it all into one. So there would just be this single view of addresses in one city council, and then you could multiply that up across all the councils. So there'd be like this one like view of addresses in the UK. It's a great idea, BS7666. It's like ingrained into my existence. And so me and my boss, Ewan Walker, we would get all these addresses and we'd have a piece of software and we would squidge them all together, which is the right address, that's the right address. A lot of it was automated, but it was surprisingly manual, as you can imagine. Anyway, we ended up having to this, go to this, this point in our project where we would be talking to all the users of the address data and we would be like, okay, so... We've got this new address database. It's going to be amazing. It's way more accurate. It's, really, it's great. How do you use addresses in your day-to-day -day business? So it's like classic business process modeling. And what I came to realize, and I can't remember if it was an observation from you or myself, but the point is we realized that how someone described their job, what their job title was, and what their boss thought they did were three entirely different processes, which was really interesting to figure out. And I think about that in terms of what you're just saying around deploying new technologies and change management. So actually finding out what somebody does, like what buttons do you press to do this thing? And what, what boxes do you click to make this thing happen? And then asking them to describe what they do. And like, it's, it, it's so interesting to find out, oh, actually, you don't do that you actually circumvent that entire process by doing this other thing instead. And if I give you something that's going to be slower than this other thing that you've figured out yourself through whatever purpose, then you're going to be upset and it's not going to work. Or if I give you this, this new process, which for some reason doesn't do this other thing which you like to do, then you're not going to do it. So it's like, it's all this stuff, which is, which is really interesting. So finding out how you can help an organization win by actually digging right into the nuts and bolts of what a company does and what individuals do on a day-to-day -day basis is so important. But boy, at scale, that's incredibly hard to do. It's, it's a very, very, very kind of manual consulting thing just to sit around and actually watch somebody do something and then compare that thing that you're watching them do to how they describe it. It's such an interesting process to go through it. I mean, like, I say this a lot, but almost every technology problem is actually a human problem in disguise. So it's like, how do you, like, how do you solve this individual's problem, make their life easier, make something go faster? 
and you do it through like in air quotes the guise of technology. And I think that's I think that's such an interesting thing. So when you start thinking about modern geospatial, like the cloud has such an opportunity to provide technology at a much faster sp- pace. Smart devices have this opportunity for you to do things in the field more effectively and with much better user interfaces than you ever had before. AI acts as your co-pilot. I mean, AI allows you to make better decisions faster. And then smart space allows us to look in places that we could never look before. So if we care about monitoring landscape changes, then we can do that. We can do that not just for one house, but a portfolio of mortgages. Suddenly, that scale becomes possible because you've got all this other stuff. All this stuff that you kind of had to just assume was okay, now you can actually check because you can see all the mortgages for a bank across North America or all the mortgages in Florida and like how much flood risk do we actually have? I'm not sure. Wouldn't it be nice to know? Or do you not want to know? I mean, those are really interesting human questions. And in the end, it is a human question because we can choose to know this information or we can choose to not know. Another thing I often say to my team is like, there's not many industries that are willing to pay for bad news. So think about that, <laughs> you know? And yeah, yeah. How often is landscape change data giving you good news? So think about those two things and then think about how to describe what it is that we're doing in the most effective manner. And that's, a, you know, there's, there's a lot of nuance in there, but it's, uh, it is definitely worth ruminating on. So I just want to share a little story about that, uh, not, you know, the idea that people don't want to pay for bad news. I talked to a company a while back. They had this interesting idea. They could look for water leaks from space. Great idea. Great idea, right? They spent ages developing the technology and then they, they would show up to, um, they, they had a couple of sort of leaps in their process, which, you know, led to them, th- th- this being a success. One of them was the observation that companies were more willing to pay for if the cost was OPEX as opposed to CAPEX. Another one was that if they showed people what they could do, that, that was a, a big leap forward. That meant that they got further in the sales pr- process each time because they said, I'm not going to tell you, I'm going to show you what I can do. Or wh- one of the last ones was not to overwhelm people because let's say they went to the, I don't know, a utilities company in Copenhagen and said, look, here are all of your leaks. You know, here are all of your problems. Expose the lot for them. And you would think, oh, great, now I can go and fix them. But it wasn't like that. It was overwhelming. And people didn't want to know where they all were. They just wanted to know where the ones they should be fixing. They wanted someone to sort of break down that problem into bite-sized chunks. Mm. And so that's what they did. And this was another sort of leap forward for them as a company, was understanding that people need, it, it needs to be, don't create another problem for them. Don't overwhelm them. Give it to them in small chunks and things they can solve and, you know, win. Yeah, give me my top 10 leaks. Don't... <laughs> Yeah, and then exactly. next week, give me my next top 10. Yeah, it's going to be wild. Good. Yeah, like make it a win for them, right? It wasn't yeah. a win going, oh, this is going to take us 58 years yeah. to figure all this stuff out. A win was, I can do something today. Yeah, I don't want to know why I'm not an Olympic athlete. I just want to know why I could be a little bit better than I am tomorrow. Yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> it's my <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you tell yeah, me, exactly. if you give me a list of all my failings, I won't even bother getting off the couch. But if you just tell exactly. me a little thing I can do, then maybe I will. Yeah, yeah it's funny. Yeah, yeah. It makes a lot of sense. I, I want to I round this off. Do you have any predictions for next year, for 2024? Predictions? That's unfair. Yeah. Uh, you know what? I think, I think we're going to see a lot of willingness to modernize. Last year uh, was a bit of a kick in the pants for the technology sector, I would say. But I feel that there'll be a little bit more capital flowing towards efficiency. Uh, I think supply chain concerns are going to go through the roof again, seeing very difficult times in the Red Sea, which means that, you know, supply chains are going to be stretched in many different directions. Uh, So understanding supply chain risk, I think will be really interesting. We're also in the midst of an El Nino, so who knows what's going to happen in terms of sort of climate-related, climate-related stoppages and, and delays and such. So I, yeah, I think, I think there'll be a lot of talk about supply chains. In the supply chain, there is a lot of talk about logistics, and logistics is a central question of geospatial. It's the question of where. So 
uh, we as a community should be deeply involved in everything around logistics. And I think there are worthwhile earth observation activities which would help that. But I think there's a lot in that kind of smart devices space and AI space, which is, and, and in fact, open, open uh, standards and open data space where that matters a lot too. So I would say from an enterprise perspective, those two things are going to be important. I think uh, commercial space will continue to be important and interesting. Uh, I think if uh, we get Starship working, then there are going to be even more sensors in the sky. And I think I would challenge the broader geospatial community with the assertion that I don't think chat GPT understands space. I think it implicitly understands location through text, but having a generative spatial model would be really interesting. I don't know who's working on that, but that would be a somewhat revolutionary geospatial application stroke opportunity. So I don't think it might, it might not happen next year, but it, I mean, it, it's going to happen. Um, so someone is, is going to create that and then deploy it and it'll be game changing. So those are my, my uh, forward looking observations. You're right. That question was unfair. Uh, but you, 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 that, that was beautiful. Well done. Well done. Um, thank you very much for, for mentioning ChatGPT. I think it's always it's great to have that in the conversation somewhere along the line. I also wanted to highlight again, you said organizations be more willing to modernize, not to innovate. To, back to the idea of modern geospatial modernization. I think that's a really important take home message for a lot of people that are going to listen to this. Appreciate that. Will, Fantastic. Really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you very much for showing up. Where can people go if they want to reach out to you, if they want to follow along, if they want to continue this conversation? Yeah, I'm easy to find on LinkedIn and X, Twitter X. Also, uh, sparkgeo.com uh, for our corporate website. And uh, my substack is strategicgeospatial.com. So you can find that there too. Uh, those would be the main, the main spots. Thanks very much, Will. Really appreciate your time. Super cool. Thanks very much, Daniel. Take care. Thank you very much for listening all the way to the end. I really appreciate it. There'll be a bunch of links in the show notes today. One of them will be to our sponsor, Scribble Maps. So if you want to augment your GIS workflows and bring GIS to all levels of your organization, check out Scribble Maps. It might just be the tool that you have been looking for. They offer a ton of functionality. They have collaborative editing. You can do business intelligence in there. You can annotate maps. Obviously, it's very, very shareable. And to be honest, there's so much functionality that I simply can't read it, you know, list it off right here, right now. It'd be worth going to their website and checking it out. I'll put a link to that in the show notes of this episode. And also, if you need more information, you can just book a demo with them. Mention Mapscaping for a discount. Thank you very much, Scribble Maps. I really appreciate your support.